As a start to our symposium, we have a, a guest speaker that needs no introduction, especially in South Africa. Uh, and over the last few months, he's become a household name and features quite regularly on ENCA. Uh, and I quite look forward to, to whenever I see him on, on, on TV and see what he's going to say. Uh, so he really needs no introduction. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to read out a short citation for him. Professor Salim Abdul Karim is UKZN's Pro Vice Chancellor of Research and Director of Kripisa. He is one of the world's most highly scientist, uh, cited scientists who sits on the boards of several journals. He's widely recognized for his scientific contributions to HIV prevention and treatment, holding appointments and memberships at institutions all over the world, including Harvard University, Cornell University, the Ragan Institute and Columbia University, where he is Caprisa Professor of Global Health. A previous president of the South African Medical Research Council, he serves on expert panels, task forces, advisory boards and committees for UN AIDS, the World Health Organization, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He is a fellow of the Royal Society and has received numerous prestigious scientific accolades. He is also the chair of the South African Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19 and a member of the Africa Task Force for Coronavirus and the Lancet Commission on COVID-19. Prof Karim has applied his extensive expertise as a clinical infectious diseases epidemiologist to the global health challenge that has defined 2020. And today we are privileged to be gaining more insight from Prof Karim as he highlights the importance of following the science in addressing the pandemic. Uh, not many people know this, but uh, about 20 years ago when, when I joined the university as a young lecturer, uh, Prof Karim was the DDC of research at the then University of Natal. And I, I believe he also just took on that appointment when I was appointed lecturer, he was appointed at that time as well. And I remember going for my introduction at the turn of the century, uh, you know, and they called Prof Karim to say a few words uh, at that time. And when he came on, uh, he said that he hadn't prepared. He was very honest, he hadn't prepared. And he said, when one hasn't prepared for a talk, the best way to start a talk is by quoting Hemingway. And, and I remember this 20 years later, I still remember what he said. So he's made an impact on me from that day onwards. And Prof Karim, it's an honor and a privilege to have you give the keynote address at our 10th annual postgraduate research and innovation symposium and our first online event. I now welcome you to give your keynote address. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Um, I recall a certain youngster coming to see me with uh, Dulcie Mulholland. That couldn't have been you, was it, Neil? Or am I imagining things? Yes, it, it was me. I had much more <laughs> <laughs> those days. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's indeed a, a pleasure and an honor to be with you here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing with you over the next 25 minutes or so, uh, just looking at COVID-19 and looking ahead. What's in store for us? Now, uh, I didn't update my slides this morning after the minister's announcement yesterday, uh, but I prepared these slides on Monday uh, when I had briefed him anyway that we were in a second wave. So it'll capture much of those issues regardless. So I'm hoping that I'll work through this presentation, tell you a little bit about how our world has changed. Um, describe the COVID-19 epidemic in South Africa, and then talk about a second surge. But here I talk about it as the prospects. Now you know we are in the second surge. And then what lies ahead for this coming year. So let's start off with how our world has changed. Look at this map. This is a map of the world. Countries that are colored in blue are those that have no restrictions in place. Countries that are co colored in yellow 
have some optional restrictions. And those that are in orange, especially the darker orange, have compulsory restrictions. The darker orange is usually a lockdown. A lockdown means stay at home orders. So what did our world look like on the 1st of March? Well, we were merrily going about our business, except if you were in China or if you were in Italy, because this epidemic was spreading and you already had restrictions in those two countries. India was just putting in some optional restrictions very early at that stage and some of the other nations in Southeast Asia. So now fast track from the 1st of March to the 1st of April. Our world has changed. We're now in a completely different situation. Several countries in Southern Africa have instituted compulsory restrictions. India has gone into lockdown, uh, stay-at-home orders, much of Russia, China, and you can see that there are uh, substantial restrictions in parts of North and South America. You can see that uh, New Zealand at that stage is in lockdown. Australia has just got some optional restrictions at that stage. Now, fast track to the 1st of June. Australia and New Zealand have managed to contain the epidemic. They've gone into no restrictions. India uh, still has its restrictions, as Russia, most of South America. China, after having released all its restrictions, has a new outbreak in Beijing. They are back in lockdown. Southern Africa, most of the countries are in the midst of releasing their lockdowns. Now, look at our situation on the 1st of August. On the 1st of August, we see things changing. Australia now has an outbreak in Melbourne, and they're going into different kinds of restrictions. You can see that some countries are easing restrictions, going into blue in Africa. Europe is almost all blue. They, they, they're now done with this, this COVID-19 epidemic and they've released all the restrictions, uh, and so too is much of Scandinavia. That's on the 1st of August. 1st of October, now you can see China is now releasing its restrictions. Oh, Australia is struggling with its outbreak in Melbourne, over 1,000 cases per day. South Africa increases a bit to, uh, uh, to, to deal with some of the increase in cases, but most of Southern Africa has released its restrictions and have just a few optional restrictions in place. Europe, still no restrictions. And look at what's happening now. Our world is changing. New Zealand has another outbreak. Australia's outbreak in Melbourne is now contained. Uh, China has a small outbreak. They go back into lockdown. Russia is in lockdown. I mean, we are seesawing back and forth. That uncertainty about where we stand is just takes its toll. And the impact has been enormous. I mean, the economic effects, when we look at this epidemic, the Lancet Commission on COVID-19, their estimation is that 90% of the countries are in recession in 2020, despite, and, and this is possibly exceeding the great economic depression of the 1930s. So just giving you some idea of the economic impact of the COVID-19 epidemic. And in Africa, of course, you know, we have to worry not just about the financial situation, we have to worry about our food security and agriculture. And we're seeing declines in agricultural production and Africa is estimated to go into a recession for the first time in 25 years. So the economic impact, the food impact, enormous. And we are all grappling with this. Our world has changed. In South Africa, what does our epidemic look like? So we uh, had our first case, if you remember, on the 5th of March. From the 5th of March, for the first 21 days, our epidemic was doubling every two days. We had a rapidly growing epidemic. We were tracking 
almost case for case with the UK epidemic. The population in the UK and South Africa is not that different. And if you look at the number of cases in the UK in the orange dots, and the number of cases in South Africa in the blue dots for the first 20 odd days, you can see how we track together. But then we took early action. The president announced on 10 days after the first case had been discovered, even before uh, we had, I think, not even 500 cases, and he announced the state of disaster, closing schools, closing the borders, you know, putting in place a whole lot of measures. And then about 10, 12 days later, instituting the lockdown, and the lockdown started on the 26th of March, which was the same day as the day on which the South African epidemic turned. And that you can see in the blue line, how the blue line now diverts itself from the, from the orange line. And we slowed the community transmission from doubling every two days to doubling every 15 days. And that slowing down of the epidemic at that stage meant that instead of having our peak in April, like they did in the UK, we pushed our peak all the way back to July. And that bought us about eight weeks or so. The net effect is that we had a situation where all of us were sitting at home and it's now six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, we're getting a bit jittery. What on earth are we doing sitting at home when there's hardly any cases? And that's what we were all asking. Why? Why are we, you know, destroying our livelihoods and when there's no, there's no epidemic around? And it's really hard to explain to people that the reason we don't have a rapidly growing epidemic is because you're sitting at home. And that if you weren't sitting at home in April, we would have been in the midst of a peak, just like the way they were in the UK. So we changed and we always knew and I try to outline this, I use the words, a difficult truth, because I said, we have to come to terms with the truth. This epidemic is still with us. We didn't dodge any bullet. We just postponed the inevitable. And that as soon as we release our restrictions, as soon as we start becoming mobile, this epidemic is gonna catch up with us. And so it did. And so when we look at the way in which this solid black line started growing, we remember it only too well, that as we released our restrictions and went to level three on the 1st of June, that's when the epidemic took off. And it took off, it did. We started growing then, and we went into the thousands of cases and eventually peaked at around 14,000 odd cases per day. And we knew that once we hit our peak, based on what we've seen in other countries, we should expect our peak to last for about two weeks. Now, we're not like the U.S. The U.S. has had, had like forever a peak, you know, and every time you think they've had a peak, they go and get a new peak. That's even worse than the old peak. But in our country, we hit our peak uh, and it lasted for about 10 days and then it rapidly uh, came down. So, and part of that is a whole range of reasons for that. I won't go into all of that right now. And we expect that within about 39 days, we should go from peak to trough, and we were well within that. And that's based on uh, our analysis of the epidemics in other countries. And we've been very, really uh, having good low transmission, a doubling time of over 200 days, actually. And in this low transmission period uh, was really the best opportunities we've had to recover our economy. And so that's what we focused on. However, as you know, the more you release your restrictions, the more people start moving, the more they start becoming complacent, you expect the cases to go up. And going up, they are. And it's going up not just in the solid black line of the new cases. Look at the gray bars. That's the seven-day moving average of admissions at hospitals. You can see how our admissions went up with our peak and then came down as our epidemic uh, waned, and then they were at a pretty low level. 
And now you can see how they are starting to rise again. And you can see that, and we, you know, we already know we have pressure on the hospitals in the Eastern Cape, uh, pressure now starting on the hospitals in the Garden Route. Um, we don't yet have pressure in the hospitals in most of the rest of the country, but it's just a matter of time before that happens. So this diagram, this single diagram, tells you the whole story of the South African COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the way in which it's impacted on our country. So what is happening at a provincial level? Well, this national increase that we are seeing here, this black line rising, it's being pushed up by the Eastern Cape that had its outbreak early and there's a whole range of reasons why it went first in the Eastern Cape. Uh, it didn't go first in the Eastern Cape in the first wave. The first wave, we had the Green Line, which is the Western Cape went first. The Eastern Cape followed by about five weeks or so. This time around, in our second wave, the Eastern Cape went first, and the Western Cape is following by about two and a half to three weeks. And you can see how these two epidemics are tracking with each other. And there's a lot of movement between the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape. So it's very hard to say you're gonna have an epidemic in one part of the Cape and not in the other. The two go hand in hand. But then look at this little bunched up set of provinces right here at the bottom. That's what's worrying. And if you look at that group, I've just given you a magnifying glass to look at that group that was bunched up at the bottom. I just removed the black line and the two big provinces where the epidemic is growing. And what do you see? Well, KwaZulu-Natal, well on its way. You can see Gauteng is following. Gauteng is running about a week to two weeks behind KwaZulu-Natal. So we are now in a situation where we have rapidly growing cases in all four of our big provinces essentially, and we've known this for a few days, that we are now in the midst of our second wave. And you can see that. And with the travel we're expecting on the 16th of December, when the factories close and the big industries close, all of these provinces that are at the lower end here, they'll all start showing increases because people from Kuzun Natal, Gauteng are gonna go back to these places and they're gonna take the virus with them and we will see basically a national second wave. The worrying part is that our second wave looks like in the Eastern Cape, it looks worse than the first wave. I'm hoping that that won't be the case for the rest of the country. Uh, there's some reasons to think that it won't be as bad, uh, but you know we have to just keep an eye out and just hope for the best. In terms of how we're doing, in terms of admissions, uh, we've had an increase in uh, diagnoses in both the private and public sector. And one of the interesting things about this infection, we see slightly more women becoming infected than men. Uh, this it relates to a whole lot of things about the amount of time you spend in sun and outside and so on. Uh, but the mortality rates, the death rates are higher in men than they are in women. You can see the blue bars, uh, especially as you get older, the blue bars, men die more than women. And that's uh, actually a phenomenon you see across the world. So why was COVID-19 less severe than we expected in South Africa? Because I can assure you, we all expected a much worse first wave. And our first wave, we were a bit sort of wondering what happened, you know, with none of the hospitals became overwhelmed, except perhaps in uh, Nelson Mandela Bay in the first wave. We coped. Uh, it wasn't, you know, a big issue. And uh, so why? What happened? And I think there are several reasons, and I'm just outlining five of them here for you. The first is we adopted the wearing of masks very early. We, are, we are started wearing masks in the, on the 7th of April. That was a full two months before the World Health Organization recommended, recommended masks. So we were one of the very early adopters in wearing of masks. The second is we have a younger population. 
we have, uh, in terms of those who are above 60, to compare us to the UK, for example, we are about one third, the number of people, a proportion of the population uh, that is older than 60. Because the more people you have over 60, the more clinical disease you get. And if you've got younger people, we've got a lot more asymptomatic infections. Then we did a lot of planning. We built field hospitals. As you know, in KwaZulu Natal, we built them at the showgrounds, the Royal Showgrounds in Cape Town. They built it at the Cape Town ICC. And the picture in the top right-hand corner is actually a picture of the Cape Town ICC. They converted the Cape Town ICC into an 800-bed hospital fully fledged with oxygen at every bed. And they did all of that in six weeks. I and mean, if you had asked me if that even possible, I said, you forget it. It takes us years to plan a hospital. They built this and it was functional. And at peak, we had about 500 patients at the Cape Town ICC. So we didn't even <clears throat> need its full capacity, but we had to plan on the worst case scenario. The other is that uh, the US, uh, the, the UK recovery trial had already released its results. And so we knew the benefits of dexamethasone. And we were already using dexamethasone quite widely in, in our, uh, our hospitals. We also, by then, by, by July, we knew that you know, we really shouldn't put patients onto ventilators unless they were really, really you know, at that stage because we would do much better putting them on high flow nasal cannula or putting them on CPAP masks. And so our clinical acumen, our ability as doctors to treat patients, we got better and better. And we had more experience, we knew how to deal with things. And that shows itself in a range of different ways. And of course, because we flattened that curve, because we postponed our April uh, peak, because just think if we had our peak in April, we weren't ready. There were no field hospitals. We wouldn't have had oxygen supply. We'd be in the same position that India is. You know, India ran out of oxygen because they just, there's just too many people needing oxygen. And when you were using high flow nasal cannula, where you're pumping you know, huge amounts of oxygen, you just run out of oxygen supplies. But in our case, we planned beforehand. We met with the four suppliers of oxygen. We worked out that they would run short of oxygen when we hit our peak. Um, about half of the oxygen that's made in our country goes to industrial processes. They negotiated with those companies not to supply them when we had peak. They redirected all of that oxygen supply to make sure all of our hospitals have adequate oxygen. So just you know, that level of detailed planning is what protected us to some extent. So, I've given you some idea of how we've done. What about a second surge? Well, you only need to look at Europe to know that things are bad, that the second surge, when it comes upon you, is really devastating. And we're seeing it country after country um, about how the second surge is, is hitting them. If you just look at our curve, and the way in which our line has been going up over the last few days, and you compare that, I've chosen a few countries from Europe to give you a comparison. I chose Europe because our epidemic runs in the same time frame as Europe, and most of our virus actually comes from Europe. Uh, so if you look at Spain, Belgium, UK, all of them had their epidemics quickly. Day zero is the day of the first patient, and they all had their first peaks and they had pretty small peaks. And now they all have had their second peaks already. And you can see, for example, in Belgium, when they had their second peak, that epidemic just hit them. My colleagues, you know, we as the chief government scientists, we meet on, on a regular basis in all kinds of different fora. And I remember that week when I was talking to him and he was describing, they ran out of beds. They had no beds, they finished. They had not a single bed left. That's how bad things were because the patients just came deluged into the hospitals. Reminded me of New York, when New York was facing this problem back in uh, March, where they just couldn't cope. Just too many patients all wanting to come into hospital at the same time. What do we know about the second surge? 
that of the 49 countries that have completed their first wave, about half of them have had a second surge. And now we know we're one of them as well. And that of the, those who've had a second surge or second wave, uh, half of them, the second wave was worse than the first one. By the way, if you want to know what distinguishes a wave and a surge, it's actually, it's a WHO, uh, World Health Organization criteria. The waves is where the virus is changing. So you, you get a second wave in the next season because the virus that's coming is slightly different. Uh, in our case, this, this virus is not different. It's the same virus. We just keep keeps hitting us here. So that's why we call it, it's the same first wave of the same virus, just a second surge. And that's what we've been hitting. And we had expected that in terms of the global average, from the end of the first surge to the start of the second surge is 66 days. That's a median, it can go out quite a while. And we were lucky because in our case, uh, that time frame was actually quite substantially longer. We were well over 100 days before we started our second surge. And so, you know, we are now in the midst of it. And, and our big risks have been that we become complacent. And uh, I, I borrowed on Mangena's diagram cartoon because I think it's so apt. When we were on level four, we were all a bit scared and we were wearing our masks and so on, but there were very few infections at the time. Then we went to level three and we started getting a bit easier. Level two, oh, now it's, you know, we don't need to worry too much. Level one is party time. And I think the part that I got quite wrong in that the way in which I envisage the way we would control the spread is that as we released government restrictions, I worked on the basis that people would understand that the government's not protecting them anymore. The government's not controlling the situation to the same extent, which means you have to control your own risk now. You have to become more careful. You have to wear your mask more diligently. So level one, you have to take at a personal level much more responsibility because we're not protecting you with government restrictions to control that. We're depending on you. Instead, it worked the opposite. As we, as the government eased restrictions, people eased their own restrictions. They didn't go the other way around. And that was a miscalculation. It's, by the way, not a miscalculation only here, the miscalculation almost in the whole world. Everybody, uh, you know, got to a stage where they just were just tired. They, they call it pandemic fatigue. And so they just stopped the social distancing and they stopped it. And so I was very pleased, you know, I'm just coming back from Pretoria this morning. And in Oat Tambo Airport, they were very strict today. I mean, very strict. You had to stand on the blue dots on the on the floor. Would not let you. You're not allowed to stand on the on the tiles. You have to stand on the blue dot. And I thought that was really good to see that level of enforcement. Then, of course, we got super spreading events. Do I need to say anything more about super spreading events? If you had, don't know about super spreading events and matric rages in Belito, you haven't been reading the newspapers. And my big concern, and I originally had predicted and thought that we would see our second wave only in the first week of January or second week of January, because I said it's the travel in December that's going to push us into that second wave. But it looks like we need, <laughs> we need to wait for the 16th of December. We're in the second wave anyway. Now you can imagine that because we've got virus spreading in all these provinces, you know, all these people are going to move now and go to the coast or go to the mountains, wherever they're going to go on vacation. I mean, we, we're heading for uh, quite a severe situation. So what lies ahead? Well, good news. First, uh, you know, I was somewhat uh, concerned about whether we could really make a vaccine against this virus. And the reason for that was we'd never made one before. Humankind has never made a coronavirus vaccine before. And so when I saw the results from the Pfizer-BioNTech trial, I was ecstatic. I mean, 
they've answered the question, right? We can make a vaccine against this virus. We can, and we've done. And it's highly efficacious, except when you start reading the fine print. So the fine print is just becoming available because all of these results were only released as press releases. They weren't uh, published in publications. This is a new way of doing science. It's a bit foreign to me because in my world, you have to publish your paper so that we can all see what the results are. And then, you know, we know where you stand. You're not allowed to just go to the press. But now, because the public really needs to know, we are changing the rules by which we release scientific evidence. Well, the first paper was published uh, yesterday, or was the day before yesterday, in The Lancet. That's the AstraZeneca Oxford University vaccine trial. And it's, sorry to say, it's good and bad news. The good news is, yes, it is effective, not as, as effective as they had hoped. It's 62% effective in the uh, high dose arm and about 90% effective in the low dose arm, but the, the low dose arm is a very small arm, so it can't make much of it. Overall, it was 70% effective. But it's effective in preventing uh, illness that requires hospitalization. Turns out, it actually doesn't stop the virus from spreading. So people are still getting infected and they are still infectious. So that, that's not going to stop the epidemic. It's just going to stop us going to hospital. Uh, and I think that that's, that's now something we're going to have to look at much more closely. So we're going to have to better understand these results. And so I don't want to make too much of those results. You know, they're still preliminary uh, the entire trial results are not out yet, but it's, it's sort of, you have to look at it. Is the glass half full or is it half empty? You can take your pick. The optimists amongst you, yay, it's a vaccine that works. The pessimists among you, oh no, this vaccine doesn't stop the virus from spreading. Okay, take your pick. But we got more good news on the way, I'm hoping. There are 13 trials <clears throat> and advanced stages. Five of them have released results so far, and all of them were very positive. Uh, we still have eight more vaccines. I'm, I provided you with their logos on the right-hand side, and some of those vaccines are pretty good. Uh, they use technologies that are actually tried and trusted and unlike the, the ones that we already know about, which are mainly new technologies. And so, you know, just watch the space. We will see uh, vaccine trial results almost on a weekly basis for the next few weeks, because I'm expecting most of these trials to report results by February. So we'll get a sense of all these different vaccines, how they work, which ones do what, and then we can make a uh, you know, careful judgment about what's the best ones for South Africa uh, as we look to purchasing them. But we have a problem. And one of those problems, and this is where you know, your college needs to play a much bigger role, in that in this international survey where people were asked about whether they would take a vaccine if one was available for the coronavirus, and if you look at South Africa, we are about the fifth from the bottom. You can see that in August, uh, you know, only 63% of the people were willing to take the vaccine. That's gone up a little bit. We are now up to about 67%. But you can imagine that if only 67%, in other words, only, if only two out of three people in South Africa will take a vaccine, how are we going to stop the spread of this virus? I mean, we really are not going to make much headway. And that just undermines our ability to actually control this virus. We're going to have to do something about this vaccine hesitancy. I mean, right now, it's not a big issue because we don't have any vaccines to offer people. But when we do, this is going to become an issue. Right now, our big problem is that even if there are these vaccines that are available, they've already been bought up. Rich countries have gone around buying these vaccines even before they know whether they work or not. For example, Canada, 
to hedge their bets, went and bought a whole lot of vaccines and bought large volumes of these vaccines. In fact, they bought so much vaccines, they have nine vaccines for each of their citizens, to just give you some idea, right? it's an overkill, because they have to hedge their bets. What if they're going to buy a vaccine and it turns out it doesn't work? So they decided just to go buy uh, you know, several vaccines. And this is being referred to a new word called vaccine nationalism, where rich countries are going and just buying up the vaccines. And the poorer countries like us, uh, you know, we don't have that kind of financial clout. We can't just go around going to a drug company and say, we'll give you so many billions, you know, keep uh, 50 million doses for us. And we hope your vaccine works. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, can we get our money back? Uh, good luck. So I think we've been much more careful and we've taken a slightly different route and we've joined COVAX. COVAX was set up by the World Health Organization, Gavi and CEPI. It's a mechanism by which 184 countries have come together to pool their buying. So we, COVAX will buy the vaccines in bulk and they will then distribute it to all of the 184 countries. And the way they do that is first 3% of the population to each country. Then they go to 10%, then they go to 20%. And nobody will get more than 20% until everybody gets 20%. So they're making sure that it's a more equitable way of distributing vaccines in the current situation. But I can tell you, we are going to be living the new normal for quite a while. Even under COVAX, uh, we can expect to get a vaccine probably around the middle of next year sometime. But we have 58 million people to vaccinate. That's not going to happen anytime quickly. That's a big thing to do. And it's a quite a difficult thing to do. So it's going to take us a long time. It's going to take us you know, two to three years to vaccinate 58 million people. We need to vaccinate about 40 million to get to close to herd immunity. It's going to take us a long time to vaccinate and to get to 40 million because if we vaccinate a million people a month, you know, that's still going to take us 40 months, three years. So you can see the challenges involved in rolling out a vaccine. And so as we do now, we just prepare and we set ourselves up. We've created uh, the basis for our plan of action, which we've approved some time ago at the Ministerial Advisory Committee, we have pretty good systems in place to deal with the second wave. Remember, COVID-19 is just a warning bell. We're going to be seeing pandemics quite a bit. And, uh, you know, just we just have to be ready. And I think this has been a lesson for us, a, a wake-up call and that we will depend on our strong public health surveillance and our public health response. And we're gonna depend on people in, in your college to help us get people behave in a way that reduces their risk. Because we really have to fight the flames. We've got to fight these little fires. Because if we don't, then we end up with where we are now, where now, you know, it's just, it's just too big. There's just too much fire, too many places. We, we don't have enough water to douse them all right now. And that's the challenge that we will face. On that note, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity and hope this gave you some idea of where things stand. Back to you, Neil. Thank you, Professor Karim. That was an excellent talk. And I think very appropriately timed at this advent of the second surge. Uh, while you've been talking, uh, Dr. Sally Frost has been taking some questions in the, the chat group, and uh, I hope you have time for three burning questions. Okay, let's, let's see what I can do. Okay. Hi, Prof. Um, the question started slowly, and then there was an absolute flood, so I'll, I'll just pick a couple. Uh, there were a whole lot about the issue of the vaccine, and the main thing people can are concerned about is when will it be here? Will it be free? Who will get it first? Will it be manufactured here? Will you have to have new ones each year? All right. Uh, the answers to those questions is longer than my talk. So clearly I'm not able to answer all of them. Let me just give you a generic answer to, to those questions, some of which I've answered, which is we've chosen 
to buy 10% of our vaccines through COVAX. That means we still have the other 90% to worry about. For the other 90%, we want to see what the results are before we make any commitments. As far as the vaccines are concerned, they come in five or six different platforms. The, the current vaccines, the ones by Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech, those are a completely new technology. We've never ever made a vaccine using mRNA before. mRNA has been a very promising technology for a little while, for about the last 10 years or so, but we've never actually made a vaccine with it before. So that's completely new technology. We have no idea how it's gonna work. We have no idea how long it's going to work. We're not sure which is gonna protect you next year. We just don't know any of those things, right? Remember the vaccine, the, the virus has only been with us for about 10 months. So we, we don't have answers to those questions. One thing about this virus is that it's quite stable. And it's got, because, you know, unlike HIV, which changes all the time, this is not a retrovirus. This RNA virus has a proofreading step in the way in which it converts RNA to DNA. The RNA polymerase it uses is pretty good. So it's true, it stays true, which means that we only see slight variations in the virus. Now, why am I explaining this to you? Because I think many of you are aware in viral evolution, the viruses, all viruses, nothing to do with coronaviruses, all viruses, all viruses evolve. When they, and how they evolve is they change their genetic structure through genetic changes. As they change their structure, two things happen. The first is that they become more infectious, more transmissible. It's, it's just, this is a story of all viruses, and it's already happening with the coronavirus, which is that uh, with time, the virus will evolve to become more transmissible. And the reason for that is very simple. When you have evolution, and in evolution, you create a highly transmissible and a poorly transmissible virus, the poorly transmissible virus wipes itself out, and the highly transmissible virus starts spreading like wildfire, as we have. And we already have uh, a variant that's highly transmissible. And we're getting, going to get many more that are even more transmissible. But as it becomes more transmissible, it becomes less lethal. And the reason it becomes less lethal is because the virus becomes more lethal, kills its host, and so it can't spread. So we will expect, by evolution, the virus will, will become more transmissible, less lethal. We also expect the virus will shift in my view and that is and we vary about this but we will see a different wave of this virus a genetically different virus in which case past infection may not protect you and the vaccine may not protect you so i think that sort of gives you enough of a gist of viral evolution and the way we got to prepare and how vaccines will work in relation to it okay we have time for uh, one more question. Okay, one more question, which I think is relevant to this audience, Prof, um, which is mainly scientists and future scientists, is what is the role of scientists in spreading or in ensuring that fake news is not perpetuated and that the government is um, advised by proper science and the public? What is our role? When you have any threat, uh, and it doesn't matter that it's coronavirus, it could be HIV, it could be anything, people become anxious and they become confused and they, the world is no longer making sense to them. So they will latch onto things that give them some kind of you know, hook onto which they can hang all of their concerns. And so conspiracy theories do very well. I, you know, I, I was involved in the HIV epidemic right at the beginning, and we dealt with every kind of conspiracy theory. Uh, one conspiracy theory was that 
you know, the US CDC or the CIA made this virus and put it in Africa. There was a rumor going around it was in the polio vaccine, all kinds of nonsense. And we've had that similarly with this, uh, uh, this situation. The second way in which we deal with anxiety is we go into denial. Now, in HIV, we had denial big, big time because some important people went into denial. Right now in the US, there are some important people in denial. We got our fair share of denial in South Africa. They just, they don't say that coronavirus doesn't exist. Their denialism is that, oh, it's just like flu. That's the, that's the, that's the coronavirus version of denialism. And we have to deal with that. Each one of us is an ambassador of science and the truth. Each one of us, whether we're talking to our family members, our neighbors, uh, to colleagues at work, we are the custodians of knowledge. We are the generators of knowledge. And we are the ones that carry the burden of ensuring that knowledge and accuracy in the information that's getting out there is there. So I, I ask each of you to do that, to make sure you're informed, to challenge conspiracy theories and fake news when you see it, because if you don't challenge it, it grows. It's got more traction than the, the truth. The truth is actually quite boring. And, and social media has created a mechanism to amplify nonsense. In fact, the more outrageous the lie, the more outrageous the fake news, the more it's going to spread in, in social media. So our responsibility is not to be amplifiers of, non, of fake news in social media and to continue our efforts to present the truth to the public. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. Thanks. Neil, over to you. Thank you, Sally, and thank you, Prof. Karim. We're extremely thankful for you for taking this time out of your busy schedule and enlightening us with your, your insight into this pandemic. I know that you probably inspired many of the young and bright minds that we have in our university and in our college. And we're extremely proud to have one of our very own leading the country in how to handle this pandemic. So thank you, Prof, and we wish you well in your day.